My name is Rob Straw. Uh, I'm the CEO of SEEP's Zurich campus based in uh, just outside of the Zurich, outside of Zurich. We're here on the lake in Horgen. The, I'm, the, the picture behind me is just a virtual picture, but if I was out standing in front at the, right at the lakeside, this is the view that I would have of our building, one of our buildings here. And it's very warm welcome to all of you coming back also to these webinars that we've been doing. Today we have a very special webinar for you, very special, and it's to, on high performance leadership with two of the, the greatest expert in the leadership field to talk to us today about this topic. Uh, the webinar is a taster, it's a sampler of what you would expect to receive and see if you joined one of our five day leading at the edge programs, which are taking place on the 10th to the 14th of January. And again, from the 6th, of 10th, uh, uh, 6th to the 10th of June, 2021. But all of this is going to be taking place in, in Zurich here in Switzerland. So that's the, the slide that some of you have seen with Professor George Colerisa and Professor Catherine Shin. Professor, I'll uh, introduce them in just a second. Uh, the Leading at the Edge program, it's a transformational program. It allows you to explore who you are as a secure base leader. We're gonna talk about that topic, that term in, in a little bit. It's about nourishing you, developing you, transforming you, growing you and your leadership potential. It's about having a positive impact on your life. I've attended this program as an observer and I've seen it's not just you as a leader, it's you as a woman and you as a man, in your life, your team, your organization, as well as your clients and even, even your family. You'll explore your own personal leadership style. You'll get tools and techniques and tricks, how to leverage your full potential and to program your mind for success. In the next hour, we're gonna have, like I said, a teaser, an overview of all the topics that the program's going to cover over five days. After the webinar, if you're interested in a deeper dive and like to know more about the program, We'll send you up with a follow-up mail. I'm always here for you as well as my program team to answer questions about the specifics of the program. During the, Q and, during the uh, webinar today, we encourage you to use, the, at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. And uh, please type in your questions in the Q&A button, not in the chat button, so that we can, at the end of uh, hearing from Professor Colerisa and Professor Shin, we're going to have a Q&A period and be answering those questions that you raise live, or as many of those as we can. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to conduct a very quick poll with you to see how you're doing. On a scale of one to 10, how equipped are you to manage the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, and the ambu ambiguity, or the VUCA-ness of leading going forward? One, give it a one if you're unequipped, and 10 if you feel like you are fully equipped. Great, have you stopped it? Okay, so we see on average that you're saying 29% of you, sorry, 20 of you have said seven. So the idea about programs like this is how to move you from a seven to an eight. Not from a seven to a 10 or for a three to a 10, but very realistically from a seven to an eight or from a six to a seven or from a three to a four. So I already see a lot of potential here when we look at the, at the sevens and the eights, that's fantastic. It's great to see that you believe in your ability to handle the VUCA-ness that's being confronted us. Thanks for that. It gives me a pleasure, a great pleasure actually, to introduce our two speakers, Professor Catherine Chin. Pa uh, Catherine is a CBS manager of, uh, professor of management. She's the associate dean for Europe. She and I work closely, I report into her actually. She's the director of the SEEPS Hospitality EMBA program that we run together with the EHL, also based in Lausanne, Switzerland. She's a serial entrepreneur. Her expertise is in leadership, organizational culture, change management, and human strategic human resource management. Professor Shin, welcome. Professor George Colerisa is an international recognized expert on leadership. He's a best-selling author. He's a consultant and a motivational speaker. He is Professor of Leadership and Organizational Behavior at IMD in Switzerland. His expertise is in conflict management, leadership, 
high performance teamwork, change management, and professional de development. George, thank you so much for being with us. I give the floor to you. Thank you, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here and hello to all our participants and welcome to this webinar. What Catherine and I really want to do is give you an overview of what will happen in this five-day program that's going to be happening in January and in June. And I can't emphasize enough that if you are looking for a program to really take you to the next steps, this could very well be the one that would do that. So if uh, you can move the slides to the next one. What we're going to over, overview is the whole process of how leadership works. And we're looking at eight pillars there, the cycle of bonding, how you connect. The number one reason leaders fail is they don't connect well. It may be in how they talk. It may be in their person effect. It may be in a whole variety of things, but they don't connect. And to be able to lead effectively, you have to be able to connect. That is for sure. And then using the mind's eye, the whole thing about focus. How do we focus? And it's possible to get so distracted in your mind that you lose track of where you're going. Rob already mentioned this, that leader as a secure base, how to build trust. Today, more than ever, with all the changes happening, we need psychological safety. Followers need psychological safety. And that starts with the secure base, the leader being able to be that trustable, dependable, secure base, while at the same time be daring, being able to challenge, take people into new areas. This is the paradox of caring and daring. And then language, and need I say more, leaders often destroy their impact by how they use words and the ability to influence and persuade. As you will hear in the Leading at the Edge, I'm a hostage negotiator, been a hostage negotiator for 40 some years, been held hostage four times myself, intervened in hundreds of situations. And what I wanna to bring to this program is the fundamental ideas that we use in hostage negotiation to get such a powerful success in influencing and persuading. The facts are hostage negotiators are able to create a bond to a hostage taker. They're able to understand the motivation and they're able then to, through concessions, get the hostage taker, give up their weapons, come out, knowing full well they're gonna to go to prison in all probability. And we get a 95% success rate. This is very powerful because what this means is that this is a leadership behavior. And you don't have to have a weapon to feel like a hostage. Many leaders feel powerless. They feel like a hostage to a situation, to employees, to colleagues, you name what's around them. What we want in this program, Kath and I are going to really help you understand how you can influence and persuade people to move forward in change management processes. Changing a hostage taker's mind and give up their weapons in 95% of the cases is a pretty powerful influencing behavior. And what is so significant is psychological hostage taking where you don't have a weapon, but you still feel powerless, can use the same techniques. Then we're gonna deal with conflict. Oh my goodness, resolving conflict. When we look at leadership failures, we see lack of connection. We see lack of security, the lack of secure base. We see a lack of risk taking, but we mostly see a lack of conflict uh, resolution. Conflicts just get in the way. And Catherine especially is gonna bring in the cultural variation on how conflicts, regardless of your culture, have to be resolved, but in different ways. And then dialogue, high impact negotiation, and emotions. We have to remember that people are fundamentally feeling beings, emotional beings who happen to think, not the opposite. They're emotional beings who happen to think. And as a leader, you have to be able to handle all the complexity of emotions in human beings. So let's go to the next slide. And in there, we're looking at 
this whole idea of how you connect, how you bond, and this cycle of attachment, bonding, separation, and grieving. This is a repeating process that happens over and over again. Leaders have to be able to bond to their employees. Leaders have to be able to bond even to people they don't necessarily like. How do you turn an adversary into an ally? How do you bond to an enemy and turn them into an ally? And to understand bonding, we have to understand loss. I don't know of any hostage situation. I don't know of any resistance to change, which we all face. That is not part of a grief process. It's the inability to get over a loss or get over a change. And what we're going to present in this program is that people naturally do not resist change. They resist the pain of change, the fear of the unknown. So you as a leader have to be able to create the psychological safety, the trust to walk people to through the process, to be able to seek a new adventure, seek a change, be able to move forward and do so positively. Change management often fails because the leaders fail to take into account the loss processes that happen. And our next slide demonstrates how this so easily can happen when we are focused with our mind's eye on the wrong things, or we focus on our mind's eye on things that are unimportant or that take us off track. We're going to be talking about playing to win taking the right risk at the right time, using your brain in such a way that you're able to bring out the full maximum potential. And playing to win is a powerful process as opposed to playing not to lose. Now you're going to learn this fundamental question. Is the brain fundamentally negative or positive? I'm not going to answer that right now, but the response is probably going to really surprise you because you as a leader have to be able to deal with people's minds and be able to, when they focus, create the right state. State is a very powerful thing that you'll see there because that determines the result. And people can get into all kinds of states that interfere or block their success. And what we know is that for most people, 80% of people, they are playing not to lose. They don't play to win, they play not to lose. And that comes from past experiences that do nothing more than create an environment for the future. So that the future is a memory of the past. Leaders have to be able to manage their own mind's eye and be able to manage that of a colleague, a team, and be able especially to manage the mind's eye of their employees. And moving right along, we also see what secure base is. Now this is going to be a fundamental pillar. Catherine and I have worked on this together for many, many years. We know how important it is. A secure base, we all need them, is a person, a place, a goal, an object, it can be many things. That gives this sense of protection, that gives this sense of comfort and offers a source of energy and inspiration. You see, you need those secure bases to help the mind's eye focus on the right things. But the goal is not safety. The goal is not psychological safety. The goal is ultimately to explore, take risks, and seek change. Besides not connecting, not dealing with conflict, a major reason leaders fail is they stop taking risks. Risk-taking is part of leadership. The right trip, uh, risk, being able to engage in a, in a risk that is appropriate, but not be driven by fear. And secure bases make that happen. Teams that have psychological safety are gonna outperform, outperform any team. Google has learned this with their Aristotle project. Many organizations have learned this. We know from the solid research, the best uh, employees develop their talents when they have secure bases around them. They are driven not by fear. And I'll, I'll answer that question now. It's, it's, the brain is fundamentally negative, looking to survive. And secure bases rewire the brain to look for the positive, 
look beyond the pain and the fear. It's shocking that 80% of people can't do that. And it's shocking the high number of leaders who think they're giving a secure base and they're not. Their person effect creates defensiveness in their colleagues, in their employees, in the teams they're working with. And understanding that, let's go to the next slide, that this caring, daring process, which is very powerful to get a great result, as you're gonna find this program, uh, Leading at the Edge, is focused on getting a result. It's being more successful. But we do that by being able to create a caring and daring environment. So how caring should a leader be? 100%. How daring should a leader be? 100%. At the same time, it's a dilemma. It's a paradox. How do you give people pain? How do you give tough feedback? How do you engage in difficult conversations? How do you even fire someone? And they say, thank you, give me more pain because they see the benefit. That's what psychological safety does. It's a very, very interesting process. Most leaders can't do it. You will learn how to do that and to do it effectively. And this whole idea of safety is very fundamental, but the goal of life is not to be safe. The goal of life is to take risks, seek adventures, etc. And then looking at not just what happens internally, and let's go to the next slide, what happens in the transactions at the social level? Because this program, Leading at the Edge, is designed to lead yourself. And if you can't lead yourself, how in the world are you ever going to lead somebody else? But then to lead others, like a hostage negotiator, in 95% of the cases, talking a hostage out of a situation to give up their hostages, their weapons, knowing full well they're going to go, probably go to prison. Well, it starts in the talking, and then it moves to the dialogue, and then it moves to the negotiation. This is a beautiful process when it's done correctly. And most cannot do it effectively. So that as a leader, you have to be able to give people everything from choice to being able to give them the opportunity to understand what it is to express what is driving them negatively. All that we do in hostage taking, you will learn how to do as a leader and to do it effectively where it's not physical hostage taking, but psychological hostage taking. Just think of the times you felt powerless, powerless to people, to situations, to customers, clients, this program will help you understand how to move out of that position. And we do this, if you go to the next slide, by looking at the dialogue. What is the dialogue as part of this? And another major reason why leaders don't fail, or why leaders do fail, is that they don't do good in dialogue. They talk too much. They don't answer questions. They talk with negative language. They talk with too much abstraction. There are so many blocks to dialogue that interfere with communication. This is, program is going to help you get feedback and improve your dialogue so that you become excellent at communication. We know that one of the major reasons leaders don't connect is it's how they talk. It's the person effect. So we want you to get feedback and really rewire your brain, move to that playing to win position to be able to effectively do that. And then we're going to the next slide, which is to talk about conflict. And remember, conflict in and of itself is not negative. Conflict actually is positive. Look at the best teams, They're, they have conflicts, they have differences, there's diversity, there's all kinds of things that happen but the conflict is used constructively. Leaders have to be able to use conflict constructively. And the basic definition we use is it's a difference. Difference is good. That's why we say conflict is good, but it can be destructive, obviously. And it's a difference between two or more persons or groups characterized by tension, emotionality, disagreement, and polarization. 
where bonding is broken or lacking. You see, you can have a big difference with someone, but if you keep the bond, you won't truly have a conflict. Or you can have a small difference, break the bond, and my goodness, you can have a huge conflict. So you have to be able to handle conflicts. If you're too conflict avoidant, we're gonna help you rewire your brain to play to win and learn how to engage constructively in conflict resolution. If you're too provocative in, provo in provoking conflict, we're gonna help you tame that down to learn how to engage in good conflict management. And remember, being able to deal with conflict means you're also able then to deal with negotiation in a different way. This program will include an aspect of negotiation and many people make a mistake in how they negotiate because they don't use power correctly. They're, they're using leverage too much. They're losing play uh, not to lose or play to, to win in a wrong way. And so we want to build the right attitude and state in dealing with negotiation so that you can negotiate many, many things in a very constructive way before having to reach that solving differences solving things by dialogue becomes so fundamental so that's going to be the part that i bring in and it's going to match what uh, catherine has and i'm going to turn that over to her for in just a second you can go to the next slide and that is if you want more information about some of the concepts and some of the readings that you can use, and we will prepare you with certain readings and, and pre-assignments and work after the program to help keep rewiring your brain. You can always go to my website, georgecorwitzer.com. And with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Catherine because the two of us are gonna work in bringing the concepts that we're both using and interlap them. So Catherine, I give you the floor. Thank you, George. Let me share my, thank you very much. I, let me share my slides here. Yeah, George and I have worked for many years together on the topic of leadership. I have lived and worked and conducted research in seven different countries and three continents. So for Leading at the Edge program, I would like to bring out the concept of culture and its impact on high performance. When we think about culture, what it is, it's really the software of the mind. Culture is, it is unconscious, invisible, but it exists in daily life just like the air. We breathe the air, but we don't really notice it. We never question and have doubts about it. So, but it is important. It helps us to judge what is right and wrong, what is proper or not proper. So to be effective leaders, we really need to take into our heart the importance of culture and its impact on leadership. Now, culture, just like I mentioned earlier on, is like a tree. Um, there are leaves and uh, trunks that we can see, but there are roots that we cannot see. We observe people's behaviors, the words they say, but really what shaped their behaviors are really their assumptions about things, their values, and all these, what we call, it, when they're much a hidden, unconscious um, things or exist there that affect people's leadership. And also when we think about leading, it's a process of influencing people. And if we not only need to understand our own cultural context, where we come from, our own perceptions and perceptual biases, we also need to understand the team. They may come from different cultural background. Like George just mentioned that a secure base is a, a person, a place, a goal, an object that provides a sense of protection, gives a sense of comfort, and offers a source of energy and inspiration to explore. And culture, when we understand it, when we are aware of it, it could help us to build secure base as a leader. So it is important. Let me give you an example 
of cultures differences right here. Let's see. There's a, here is a conversation going on between two people. And uh, what's going on in this conversation? Let's see. Uh, Mr. Crook said, we will need to keep the production line open this Saturday. Ms. Chin from a different culture said, I see. Can you come in on Saturday? It will be helpful. Yes, I think so. It will be of great help. Yes, Saturday is a very special day. It is my son's birthday. Yeah. Oh, I hope you will enjoy yourself. Thank you for your understanding. As you can see, this is a conversation that happened between a supervisor and an employee coming from a different culture background. And the different culture background you can see is that one is a, we call it a high context culture. A high context culture or low context culture, sorry, let me talk, about, yeah, I can talk both. But low context culture is really um, where you communicate with words that really explain a lot of meanings. Words, you look at the picture, you have words, gestures, and the facial expressions. And in a high context culture, words occupies a smaller space. We really need to understand silence, gesture, tone of voice, the context, the posture, the place, the relationship, the previous interactions, etc., etc., etc. When yes is not a yes, no is not a no, how are we going to influence and reach agreement and also resolve our conflict, for example? When we resolve our differences, as in the eight pillars of high performance leadership, um, eye contact is very important, but it means very different things in different culture. During negotiation, we have done experiments with uh, Japanese executives and American executives. Japanese executives, since Japan is a very high context culture, so they will pause and keep a little bit longer in silence. While United States is, relatively speaking, a low context culture. Therefore, when the pause happens, the silence happens, the American executives tend to con make concessions very, very quickly. This is almost little, like a little trick. You can negotiate, you have a silence, and with different people, you get very different results. These are some of the contextual uh, variables or contextual impacts we should be very much aware of. This will be discussed and I will also will create experience for you to experience different cultures and to think about differences, not only just culture differences, including gender differences, for example. But, but putting all this together, we will look at, you know, when we're dealing with high context culture and culture differences, we first need to map, understand the differences and bridge, communicate across the differences and integrate. Now, should we pay more attention to the differences or should we try to emphasize similarities and mimic the differences? This is a, a very good question. And we are going to discuss this question with many research in this area. We have some definitive answers to this issue. So leading at the edge program will not only talk about high performance leadership, it will add to some very important contextual issues such as culture, gender, and all that. I will just stop right here for now. Beautiful, Catherine. Thank you, George. Thank you, Thank you both. I'm, I'm already excited. <laughs> I love to listen to you guys. I, I know your stories, but I can listen to it over and over. And each time, because I'm in a different place, and just like the participants in a different place, it's a new again, and it's fresh again. The context with, with, that we're in as people uh, has changed. Yeah. I think the thing we want to communicate, Rob, uh, is that this is not a typical leadership uh, mm. course. This is a course in which it is both personal 
and external in the social context that it's dealt with so that you go deep inside. We don't use many cases. We use each individual as a case, but it really brings out the transformational nature of what's possible in each person to have that stronger impact. Right. We've got a bunch of questions. I'd like to field some of them if we could. Okay, great. All right. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to call on Tina. Tina is a graduate of our EMBA program. She's asked the question. Um, Tina's, let me just, can we tap her in? Can we put her in? Yeah, okay. Let's get Tina on there. She'd like to ask it directly. Hello. Hi, Tina. Hi, Hi, Tina. Hello. Thank you very much. Thanks to both professors for this very inspiring sharing and preview. So starting from Professor Catherine's latest point, I would be interested to understand in your experience and view, is it possible? Or how, how do cultural differences impact uh, high performance leadership in the sense that is it possible to reach the same level of high performance in leadership um, in a multicultural context? Yes, I definitely think it's possible to reach a high performance leadership in a cross-cultural context. And it is not the difference. We need to understand the difference, accept the difference, but we need also need to bridge and integrate in teams and the leadership situations. So, you know, it is not about creating laser light to highlight the differences. What do you do not want the diversity about? To just say, oh yeah, we are different. We all know that. We would like to, how can we, you know, let create the white light and let all the differences shine. So we leverage on our differences and let the differences create value for us. So that brings out the best of leadership. Like people can come from different cultural backgrounds, can come from different uh, functional backgrounds that can add to our creativity, can add to our innovation. And uh, so we can, if we can leverage on our differences, starting from understanding and integrate our differences, we can create results beyond our expectations. It is definitely possible to do that, but we need to practice. Like George said, it is not about understand it in, um, you know, in our mind. It's really the behavior side and how we practice it so we have a really mastery of it. The whole class is not about teaching concept. It's yeah. about practice, about role play, and it's about simulation. I hope Tina yeah. I answered your question, or part, partly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. George, I'd like to ask you a question now that came in. How caring and daring should a leader be? Again, as we're thinking back in the last six months, this crazy world that we're, that we're in, how do, how do we balance this? It's 100% each. This is the paradox. This is a dilemma. Being 100% caring and 100% daring. How do you do that? Well, it's like the parent who has to deliver the consequences to the child. It's like the leader who has to give tough feedback. It's daring, but it's done on the foundation of caring. Mm -hmm. Caring is a state. It's a way of being, of creating psychological safety. And when that happens, you can be 100% caring and 100% daring. What happens for many leaders is they rescue people. They absolutely engage in rescuing behavior because they feel sorry, they're too affiliative in their style of leadership. So they have to be able to do what's necessary and do it in such a way that people see the benefit. They see the benefit. But to do that, you have to understand loss. Mm -hmm. People suffer loss or a feeling of loss and when the leader is unable to be compassionate or empathetic in that, they cannot be caring. But caring is not rescuing. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna come back to culture for you with you, Catherine. And all three of us here, Catherine, you and George have this experience too for living for decades in countries other than your home country. And so you also have experienced this, not just from a theoretical standpoint or teaching or the research, but in your person as well and in, in your work. How can you earn trust 
in an international cultural environment. When you're different, how do you earn trust? Well, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try first and the George, you can uh, add and uh, add more on. I think when you think about trust, even though we have different culture, uh, you know, we have coming from different cultural backgrounds, but trust actually is, uh, I think is universal anywhere as a concept. When you trust someone, the person can speak with credibility, like George, you are the hostage negotiator, negotiate an expert in resolving conflict. So I trust your words. And then trust the build on behaviors. Uh, we trust people when they say uh, they do what as they promise. So we look at the behaviors of what they do. And also we trust people when they have goodwill. They think for me and they try to help me. The, um, so I think that when you have that in mind, in no matter which culture you are in, you can create trust. But of course, when you try to build goodwill, there are many different ways to build it. In some cultures, goodwill can be built by, we call it tough truths, right? I, I, I'm really good for you, but I tell you something that you, it's not really pleasant. But in some cultures, it's okay, you can do it in public. But in other cultures, you really have to pay attention to people's face. In high context cultures, you just need to be very context alert. So your, your eye contact, your tone, your gesture will all convey goodwills in a very different ways. But when you say something with credibility, when you do something with reliability, and you are not too self-centered, that's also very important. I think you can create trust in whatever different cultures we are in. Thank you. Yeah, I, can I add something to that, Cancer? Sure. Yeah. So it's exactly what you're saying. It's the person effect, all those variables, but it comes down to one word. Are you interested in the other person? Do you give a sense of service? It is easy to bond across cultures when you have that foundation of interest, that foundation of service, and people know you have the right intention and you have the right meaning and purpose. And this is very important in leadership because leaders often are too focused on themselves. Who is the most important person in a leadership process? It's not the leader, it's the other. But many a times leaders don't communicate that they're there to serve or that they're there to uh, give meaning to what they're doing. And this is very important to understand as we're gonna deal with in the program, the, the developmental stage of leaders, because as you begin, if you're a young MBA, you're a young leader, you have to be able to prove yourself, get your own identity, know that you can do it. But there comes a very important shift in identity when it goes from, from proving something about yourself to being able to then move to service. Service, thank you. Okay. Definitely. Great. I'm gonna move on. Again, this is meant to be just some sampling. So you could, I know you both could spend hours just dialoguing about that one topic. I mean, there's so much that both of you have done around the topic of, of trust and serving. Um, but I still wanna uh, entertain some of these other questions. We have Floris. Floris van der Waalt is an expert in talent development based in Europe, he's asked the question, to build a secure base, we shall have to address the emotional side of leaders. How do you intend to address the emotional side and not only the intellectual reflection? You want me to take a shot at that? Please. And then sure, you come yes. in. So we have, we're going to have people write success stories and failure stories. We're going to have them look at the crucibles in their life. What have been the most difficult moments in their life? What have been the most positive moments in their life? How much grief do they carry? The way to open emotions and the heart is primarily through pain, mm -hmm. understanding what you have experienced. And there is no escape from grief. It's the ability to open the heart, feel that pain and be able to go beyond that pain and reconnect to the joy of life. So there are many people who are unable to do that. They close their heart. 
They close their emotions. And so they cannot lead effectively. We know vulnerability and the ability to genuinely, authentically, emotionally connect with empathy is fundamental to leading and to caring. Uh, so we, we open those emotions, not by force, but by giving the opportunity for people to examine, as Warren Bennis said, the crucibles in their life to understand the foundations of their leadership. You became the leader you are, the character you are as a leader, not by the benefits of bonding that you've had, that's important, but by the benefit of what you've learned from the negative experiences. And sometimes there are such painful events in people's lives that have been denied or ignored. And so they can't really maximize or use it in their leadership behavior. We want people to understand that, not by force, but by having the opportunity to explore that openly and honestly in a social structure. Uh, can I add one thing? Also during the program, we are going to involve uh, some extremely experienced leadership coaches. And they, you will work in a very small team with experienced coaches together with George and myself. This will allow opportunities for people to really share and bring out some of their emotional um, stories and experiences in their life. And uh, like George mentioned before, you are the case, case studies. We do not give you Harvard Business School case studies and we really, you are the one, right, George? Right, <laughs> and it's the most interesting case in the world, right? Who we are. Exactly. Yes. But it is very much so an emotional journey it's, it's to answer that question. It's not an intellectual uh, dialogue. It's an emotional engagement. I can promise you that that is the experience of this program. You know, there's a lot of the, the George's words it come from uh, psychology of his background as a clinical psychologist. You, it's not just by, by per se that, that that's happening. It's because that's his original training, right? I'd like to go to Stan's question. Uh, Stan uh, asked the question, is there a difference between HPL and leading at the edge? And if so, what is that difference? Yeah, there is a difference. And the difference has to do with the cultural aspects. It's a much broader culture. And it's the fact that Catherine and I are stepping in together, creating an environment for you to think about how you go to that very, very edge. Whereas HPL is the high performance leadership program is, is more restricted and has some other kind of events. We're, we're doing uh, things to push the edge of leadership. Okay, thank you. Catherine, anything on your side? Yes, I think exactly what George said is right. And also we try to, together, we work together on the program for many years and we build on each other's strengths uh, together. And it has a basic, you know, the, all the component you'll have with high performance leadership, plus the component you'll have with challenges we're facing, such as, uh, you know, culture differences and the, the turbulent environment we are in. And it's really what George has mentioned as the edge, what's the edge right there? Mm -hmm. We really want to push our boundaries right there and comfort zone right there. So it leads me to the next question. You know, I often say the soft things are the hard things. It's very er easy to learn how to calculate a net present value calculation or, you know, some of the technical things that we learn in, in, in the schools that we're working with and for. If the soft things are the hard things, why is it so hard? Why is that? Oh, boy, that's the, that's the question. I think it has to do with the brain. Things get locked in the brain as wired, as a habit, and suddenly those little things that get in the way, the smile, the, 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 what Catherine talked about with the cultural variations, uh, they get locked in the brain and you don't think about the importance of saying hello with a smile. You don't think about certain behaviors that are going to inspire. And in the end, leaders are failing in inspiring. They're often over-demanding results so that we really have to understand 
how to get those soft things back to the forefront. And, and we've, we've been seduced into thinking the best leadership is hard leadership. The best leadership is telling people what to do. Well, I don't know any hostage negotiation anywhere that's been solved by telling the hostage taker to come out. No, you have to engage in a process of influencing and persuading. And leaders often don't know how to do that. They take the simple route, tell people what to do. They become coercive or they become too affiliative or they become pay setters and they don't inspire people. It's so sad to see people not fully engaged in their work, not truly enjoying it. We will definitely invite people to come out of this program inspiring employees, inspiring themselves, and being able to come back to the full joy of, of work, and in some cases, the full joy of life. Thank you. Next question from Mr. Lowe. How do you avoid having, empl having employees becoming too comfortable, the extreme end of a secure base? <laughs> Well, the, the, the goal of a secure base is not security. The goal of life is not security. What's the goal of life? It's to seek adventure, to explore, be curious, so that the, it's a foundation. It's like a house built on a foundation. So if you are letting people get too complacent or feeling too safe, then you're not daring them enough. Mm -hmm. So it means that you have to be able to help people understand how to take risks, the right risks, and to be able to move forward in a way that they challenge themselves. People who are living for security are going to be disappointed. Life is not about security. So it's, it's in the mind, it's in the mind's eye, and it's in the relationship, and it's in the models that you create and the expectations that you create. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Catherine, maybe you can speak to the fact of how risk-taking happens, uh, how secure bases happen in different cultures, because it's one thing in China, it's another thing in Europe. Hmm. Well, I think uh, the secure, secure base is needed and uh, is uh, appreciated and valued and for every culture, as far as I can see, the cultures and countries I lived in, it's, uh, we all need that but we may create it differently with a different cultural context right there. The whole program is not about giving you the security. That's really true. You will be energized and inspired after the program. So daring is what we, in the end, we would hope to achieve. When we have an employee who is a, a complacent or not try to have uh, aim at a high standards, what the leader's role is not try to punish them, rather is to inspire them, to provide them with a secure base so that they can move forward and really to have a dream and inspiration of their own. That's about high performance leadership or leading at the edge. Great, yeah, leading at the edge, exactly the name we gave it, right? <laughs> at the edge, and at the edge of a precipice, it's not comfortable. Right? It's definitely not comfortable in that, in that place, right? Yeah. Um, next question. Um, with regard to culture, how is the work of Gerd Hofstede relevant or an inspiration for you? I think uh, his work is surely very, very important. It's a really inspiring work. Um, many of the scholars interested in culture studied Hofstede's work. But based on his work, and uh, we have broadened, in, enriched the framework and research in different, uh, in different um, industrial contexts, organizational contexts, and it was not many more individuals. Mm. So definitely it's inspiration. And we try to build on his work and move forward with that. Okay. Um, I'd like to come to the next question. Why is psychological safety important for high performance leadership? Well, Google found out in spending millions of dollars and three years of researching, looking at high performing teams, that it was psychological safety as the one key variable that made the high performing team. 
And how do you create safety in a team? Well, we know how this works because the brain is fundamentally negative. It's looking for pain and danger to survive. If you live with that mindset that you're always wanting to survive, you become in the extreme paranoid and you come at a lesser level with states of anxiety, fear of making mistakes, fear of failure, all the things that stop you from really leading. So you have to rewire your brain from being focused on that negative to being able to focus on seeing opportunity, being willing to be hurt, being willing to endure loss, all those painful things. And so safety is like a parent who is able to provide the protection for that child to go out and explore the world. The child wakes up in the middle of the night filled with fear, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, there's a monster in here. The parent comes in and as a secure base says, no, there's not a pain. You can go back to sleep. I'll lay down here with you while you go to sleep. And the child turns off the negative mind's eye looking for danger. And uh, after a short time, the parent can leave. Some people never get over their fears. They never are able to feel that security. And as Catherine said, the goal is not safety. The goal is exploring. The goal is living life as an adventure. And wow, the world is filled with opportunities for adventures. And leading at the edge is about innovation, about looking for all kinds of ways to live life as an adventure within the work or in personal life in combination. Thank you. Um, interesting question. To what extent should a successful leader engage in a team member's personal issues or experiences? Catherine, you want to take a hit at that? Well, I think that uh, there is a boundary we, lead, we need to observe uh, in the work settings. So, but on the other hand, we need to balance the caring and daring side. We do care about our team members, uh, even in their personal space, provided it's, there's a confident <coughs> level right there. There is a boundary we have to observe. It is a work, it's a, if it's a, if I understand it correctly, it's a work situation right there. So it depends on how much trust you have between you and the employee and the uh, subordinate or team member. And also, I still think that the boundary of the workspace needs to be observed. Um, that's, that's actually for me, that would be my answer to the question Caring can be exercised in uh, many different ways. Getting into employees' personal life probably may not be the team leader's job. Yes. I'm not talking about the job. I am talking about the space and the boundaries right there. Yeah. George? That's exactly it, the boundary. I'm often asked, well, do we want psych leaders to be psychologists? And the answer is no but the leaders have to be a little bit of a psychologist. If you don't take into the count the psychology of human behavior, you will never succeed as a leader. So for example, if you have an employee who's overly aggressive and you, you coach them on that, you give them feedback, and then you sit down and say, look, unless you manage that aggression, I can't continue to let you deal with other employees or customers. What is going on that you're so aggressive? And it may be that you then open up, well, I grew up in a household where I was screamed at and yelled at by my father. I don't know any other way to get people to respond. I'm, I'm lacking patience. So you invite the person to talk about it, never forcing a conversation. You're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but you have to take into account personal histories and people often are not taking that into account that interferes with their success. Let's face it, if you're too aggressive, too impatient, too afraid of authority, you have to come to understand where does that start? Where does that come from? And to do something about that. This program with the coaches will give, a, give you a chance to examine that. But as a leader in a normal working situation, you're not going to be prying into people's lives, but sometimes they'll expose it just because it's there. Okay. Thank you. 
There's a couple interest. We've got so many questions left that I, we're not That's good. To them off. <laughs> a lot of curiosity, Rob. A absolutely. I'm going to ask a couple of the ones that are very specific. In multicultural teams that are project specific and time bound, how does one quickly establish a clear sense of direction from the leader's perspective? Catherine, you want to take that? Yeah. We're talking about the, uh, Rob, first I want to make sure it's talk about the cross-culture teams, right? Yeah. Yes, okay. When we have a limited time and the limited resources with the object we try to achieve at the moment, I think it's very important we develop some cultural norms or behavioral norms for working together in cross-culture teams. Because although we mentioned we have differences in our cultural values, but let's not forget, we are more common, we are more similar to each other than we are different. Mm. Let's, we, when we are pressed with time, with a clear objective and limited resources, let's look at our commonalities in terms of our, how to get along with such, each other and lay out maybe clearly a way how we interact, we make decisions together and uh, manage that when we don't have enough time to explore uh, many other um, cultural related issues. Mm. But be aware and ask a question. Sometimes I think uh, when we doing the program of leading at the edge, George will lead us to look at how to have a constructive dialogue. We coming from different cultural backgrounds and then during the process, we will learn that if we do not, are not sure about our communication, especially nowadays, we communicate with Zoom, with a telephone, with a WhatsApp. We don't even see each other in person. Many things get lost. So we need to make sure we understand each other accurately. Mm -hmm. So we need to learn how to paraphrase a question and answer and make sure we understand each other you know, candidly and truthfully, and that's the first step. That's what I would say. George. Oh, I, I would ask? say it's a, it's a little bit like a chef. A leader's a little bit like a chef cooking. Culture is having many different spices, ingredients, but you need a goal. You have to know what your goal is. So on a multicultural team, let's get clear what our goal is. And everybody brings a piece of spice or a piece of food. And boy, you end up with a wonderful, tasty meal if it's done correctly. But you have to know the goal. But a, a, a bland food lacks culture. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, maybe you can share the final slide again. Thank you both very, very much. We've still got a bunch of questions and we've run out of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'd like to send you both the questions and maybe uh, Hannah or I can give you a tip. You know, if George, you could answer two or three of the questions and if sure. Catherine could answer two or three and sure. in our response yeah. to all of the hundred participants online, we'll provide all of you with that in writing. Um, so some ideas of, of, of the questions that are still out there, because every time you answer a question, three more pop up, you know how that works. So uh, great, great questions coming in. It's very exciting. Uh, I'm very excited about this program. We look forward to have and host uh, Catherine and George here in January and in June of next year. And we look forward to receiving your requests about uh, information and registrations. Uh, the, the program participation is limited. We're not going to have this open for that many people because of the number of, of coaches that we need to run the program to really serve you best during that week. So please register and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you soon in Zurich. Thank you. Can, both. I, can I say one thing, Rob? Yes, please. And, I, and speaking on behalf of Catherine as well, we would really, really welcome you to come and uh, participate in this exciting program. Thank you, Definitely. everyone. Thank you, George. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.